All right, welcome back everyone. Um, moving on today, talking about government and politics. Big, big issue right now. <clears throat> um, you know, I'll touch upon some of the ways in which government and politics is changing um, as a result, but really just kind of introduce you to the ways in which, uh, you know, classical sociologists have thought about, have thought about government and its role in uh, society. Uh, first of all, just to, you know, kind of talk about the topic, um, some of the commentary and the way that I, I think in which some of the media are describing this pandemic, you know, it's kind of like this is just some rare event so that, you know, nobody saw it coming and, uh, you know, our society will, you know, just kind of go back to normal after this and so on, or normal as in terms of what it was before. That's probably not the case. You know, if you look at the history of disease and infectious disease, um, it tends to have a huge impact on societies and it often tends to change the ways in which society operates, uh, oftentimes changing the role of government and so on. So these are a couple of books um, looking at that subject. One of the problems facing democracy, and we're going to focus on a lot on democracy today, um, one of the challenges facing democracy is what's called state overload. Uh, there's a concern that the modern state, modern government, uh, is just too overburdened with uh, all of these responsibilities. It's just you know, it's not nimble enough to take on the challenges of today. There's too much bureaucracy, uh, too much red tape, you know, so on and so forth. And governments are just overwhelmed with all, all these things that they have to do. So that's one theory that democracy uh, is facing some challenges. And some people may argue that, you know, we see this happening in the West in their response to COVID-19. Uh, maybe they're just too overwhelmed. Maybe the United States is just too overwhelmed. That's why its response has been uh, generally inadequate. Well, maybe, but, you know, if we look at what's going on, uh, it's pretty, it's kind of incredible. So, you know, the government is providing, you know, provides most of the data, the research on coronavirus. It's also managing a lot of the response, um, which right now has been a bailout. And as that cartoon up there shows, I mean, within a matter of weeks, you've had people who say they, you know, would never be in favor of a bailout and uh, the free market should dictate, you know, economic action and so on. All of that has kind of fallen apart. You see a lot of people now are in favor of bailout. Uh, very few people <clears throat> are advocating just a free market approach to the pandemic. Uh, so, and, and a free market approach to um, the losses that uh, organizations, companies, and so on are going to face. Um, you know, pretty much everybody is, is asking for government action. So we're probably going to see in the West, the state become bigger, the government uh, become bigger, um, you know, and take on more responsibilities. We'll talk about, you know, some of the potential implications of that. So is this state overload? Um, hard to say. Now, you know, what the government does, you know, from a functionalist perspective, uh, they try to you know, ensure that the society is relatively relatively stable. One of the most important things is making sure the citizens are safe from uh, from attack, as well as making sure that they're generally healthy. Um, you know, this many of us knew this was coming. We knew that a pandemic at some point was probably going to happen in our lifetime, um, and we also knew that a couple of years ago, when the Trump administration cut. Uh, the pandemic, the, the pandemic response group, that this would be a bad decision. And this, you know, tweet was made by Stephen Schwartz um, pretty much right after this pandemic group was, was cut a couple of years ago. And you can see the, the, the coverage of this and, you know, when it's been mentioned and when it hasn't been uh, over the last uh, few weeks. Um, you see that the Wall Street Journal and USA Today have not mentioned uh, that uh, the president fired the pandemic teams back in 2018. 
uh, a few articles, uh, you know, a few newspapers have, um, but, you know, tellingly, uh, the Wall Street Journal in the USA Today has it. Um, that's pretty important because, you know, the response could have been different if we would have had the pandemic team uh, in place. So this is changing, you know, it's having a huge impact on government and we're seeing um, <clears throat> some interesting numbers in terms of who people are, are trusting. This is from a couple of weeks, uh, from a couple of weeks ago. Um, but you know, not a lot of people are trusting the president, um, <clears throat> about even trust for the media. You have a lot of people trusting their state and local governments, which is kind of interesting. And <clears throat> which I, this is, a, I think, a good thing. Uh, a lot of people trusting public health experts. Uh, if anybody, if we should be trusting anybody right now, um, it's the public health experts. The other, you know, another crisis that uh, democracy faces is the legitimation crisis. This is this idea that uh, people are seeing democratic government as being uh, less legitimate, as being less representative. So this is something that we have seen in the United States going back to the 1960s. Um, especially with the Vietnam War, uh, you know, as it became clear that the government was lying about the reasons that we were there, as well as, um, you know, just some of the basic facts on the ground. Uh, this, you know, led to disillusionment, a, a loss of trust uh, in the American government. You also saw um, <clears throat> during this time the government engaged in a whole bunch of uh, sort of activities that were illegal. Uh, this also was, you know, caused uh, less, caused people to see less legitimacy in the government. This was followed in the early 1970s by the Watergate scandal, um, where operatives broke into the Democratic Party headquarters. Uh, it was later, co late, later covered up by the Nixon administration. Uh, that administration was, was impeached and he resigned, or actually he resigned before he, before he could be impeached. Um, you know, and then later on you, you have, you know, in my lifetime, uh, the, the wars in Iraq where, you know, we went in to find weapons of mass destruction, we didn't find any, there were just a bunch of reasons given, uh, none of them really panned out in reality. Um, and then, you know, more recently, well, another, a couple other things too, uh, the Electoral College. Uh, twice in my lifetime, in the election of 2000 uh, and in 2016, you've had uh, the president lose the, the popular vote, meaning lose uh, the majority vote, um, but, but still win based upon the Electoral College math. And, you know, whatever you think about the Electoral College, that it leads to a loss of legitimacy for uh, the process and, and those presidents when it's known that uh, a majority of the citizens actually voted for the other person. Um, and then you have the economic crises of, of, of 2008, 2009. Um, you've had, I think right now, you have the pandemic, uh, which, is causing, which is causing also uh, a legitimation crisis. Um, in the United States, you know, where we have these political parties and, you know, the ideas that we're you know, supposed to come together and uh, um, debate and, you know, work out compromises, that doesn't really happen so much. And really the last few years in the United States uh, have been years of division and uh, discord, as you're probably well aware, um, and intense political passions and you know it's unclear where where this goes we we'll kind of just have to wait and see is this the end of america um, from this scene from uh, planet of the apes um well some people would say that there are plenty of things that would lead you to lead one to uh, think that democracy might be in trouble in the united states and and perhaps elsewhere um, a couple of good books that, that talk about this. Upheaval by Jared Diamond. You may remember that name. He wrote uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, which is relevant to today, you know, talking about how uh, disease was, the, the spread of disease, you know, kind of uh, accompanied European conquest and was one of the main reasons why Europe uh, was able to dominate other parts of the world. 
Uh, he also has a book called Upheaval, where he looks at a number of nations that go through various things, uh, various collapses of some sort, uh, and then, you know, kind of rise out of it. Um, you know, something for us to think about, you know, very, you know, as we, as, as many, many nations in the world right now, perhaps every nation in the world right now uh, is experiencing some, uh, some form of upheaval. When we talk about politics, you know, we talk about liberalism and conservatism. And we've kind of, you know, discussed some of this uh, in the past when we talk about culture and sociobiology, talking about some of the attitudes underlying conservatism, what, such as uh, tradition, you know, uh, feelings of, of the need for order and stability um, are, are psychologically predisposed. Same with uh, some liberal attitudes. Liberal attitudes such as openness to new experiences, innovation, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, we kind of talked about how they're kind of a yin-yang. You kind of need both liberalism uh, and conservatism. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. I should just come back to this. And these are philo historical philosophies that have that have a, a kind of a deeper um, meaning than what you see in the general political press. Uh, so you know, if you're interested in politics, I would you know say focus on the uh, on the more serious issues so you get grounded in that. Um, then you can deal with uh, sort of 24-hour social media fluff uh, that, that we too often see. Okay. Uh, one of the classic works in sociology and in the study of politics in general uh, was this, this series of, or this lecture given by Max Weber called Politics as a Vocation. Um, vocation meaning as an occupation, a career, that sort of thing. So he was looking at, okay, what is it about the occupation of being a politician that sets you apart from others? Interestingly, people have done uh, experiments in neuroscience where they've looked at parts of the brain that get activated uh, when politicians are making decisions and they look at the brains of other people and so on and so forth. And uh, particularly when they're making decisions on behalf of other people. And they find that in politicians, the same parts of the brain are activated when they make decisions on, on behalf of others as we see in drug addicts uh, when they are, you know, when they get their drug uh, that they're addicted to. Very interesting. Anyway, uh, going sort of, you know, kind of looking at more philosophically, uh, Weber said there are kind of two main things that a politician must balance. One is this ethic of moral conviction. And these are those personal beliefs, those core values uh, that are unlikely to change. Often you can think of uh, views on abortion. That's, you know, kind of a, a good example. Um, where, you know, generally politicians will have some view on this and it's, you know, they're not really going to change it. However, they also have this other duty and that's the ethic of responsibility. This is just the day-to-day -day operations of government. Um, using the government for the greater good, meaning that, um, you know, despite how you may feel about these certain issues, you still have to go in there and, uh, you know, figure out, you know, the latest highway bill or, um, uh, you know, vets uh, assistance bill or something like this. Um, that, you know, politicians then, especially in the democracy at least, have to uh, balance their personal values and their core beliefs with what they have to do to make government function uh, so society can just function uh, more smoothly. Weber also identified these three different types of authority. Um, one is legal rational authority. And so that's the first type. Sorry if that's not very clear on this slide. Uh, but so legal rational authority, this would be like governments the United States government, the, the government in China, most governments uh, around the world today uh, are legal rational. This means that the power generally is in the position, not in the person. So it's not like a warrior democracy where, you know, the, you know, the strongest warrior becomes, becomes the leader. Uh, the power is in the position, the position of senator, uh, the position of president, that sort of thing. So power is anchored in these institutions and in these rules that have been built up over time. And so it's very much a bureaucracy. So it can be sort of a, um, uh, a one-party state like you see in China, or it can be a democracy with many different parties like you see uh, in the United States and, and elsewhere. 
So this is in contrast to what Weber called traditional authority. So traditional authority I'm generally ref referring here to uh, oftentimes tribal authority, um, you know, monarchy, royalty, that sort of thing. You know, the authority comes from uh, the connection to the past. You know, this authority based on habit, customs, uh, you call it sometimes called patrimonial authority. Um, power is in family and kinship networks, and basically people get uh, their positions in government based on who they know often, uh, not necessarily on their skills or qualifications and things like this. And then finally, I think this is one that's very interesting and has sort of come back um, sort of come back in the last few years. It's called charismatic authority. And Weber was writing about this and thinking about um, people like Napoleon. And that was probably the best example that he could think of at that time. There were other leaders too. Um, today we would think of people, you know, like um, Adolf Hitler. Uh, these are leaders who have a lot of charisma, certain charms, there are certain things about their personality that allow them to generate, you know, these large followings. And they oftentimes will tr challenge traditional orders, uh, whatever those might be. So Weber pointed out, though, that they're not all like Hitler, though. They, they can be, they're just as likely to be good uh, or heroic as they are to be evil tyrants. Um, so they can be, you know, good leaders that are just, you know, doing great things for their people and, and so on. Um, but their power generally comes from the power of their personality, not necessarily uh, on, on other, for, for other reasons. So I say up here, you know, examples, Hitler, Mussolini, Bonaparte, you could also have people like Jesus Christ, uh, or Mahatma Gandhi, for example. Um, I list Winston Churchill, Margaret Thatcher, Barack Obama, Donald Trump. These are leaders who have sort of charismatic qualities and tendencies. Whether they have charismatic authority, that's probably up for debate. I probably sh maybe should have, you know, added a caveat to their names on there. Um, they have they had tremendous, you know, power power and charm. You know, Obama gives powerful speeches. Trump is known for, uh, you know, the way in which he's relatable to his his followers and so on. So it's often the, the their charm, their charisma that gives the, gives them a lot of power. In systems of traditional traditional charismatic authority, uh, usually they're non-democratic, we often find that their that power ends when they die, uh, or they're overthrown, or or they leave office for some uh, some other reason. Which brings us to De Weber's definition of the government itself. So Weber pointed out that the state itself is this organization in which uh, power resides. And the state, and here's, here's how he defines government, uh, is the organization that has the legitimate use uh, of, of violence within a territory. So this means that basically the government has, um, is recognized by most of the people in the territory um, as having authority to use violence to enforce laws uh, or protect against invasion or do other things to advance uh, the collective national interest. Now, not everyone agrees, may, may agree with the state or how it used mili uses violence and so on, uh, but there's this general understanding that the modern state, that's, you know, that's, where, uh, that's where police and military power uh, generally resides. And today, most of, you know, terrestrial Earth uh, is comprised of nation states, and meaning that these are organizations that have the monopoly on uh, violence within the territory. Those that do not have a clear monopoly on violence are usually engaged in a civil war. So where did this kind of the modern nation state come from? Uh, it, it comes out of the out of the Thirty Years' War in Europe. So very bloody, you know, war that was you know about religion as well as feudal dynasties and you know, shifting systems and so on. Uh, you know, very bloody conflict. People, you know, the people involved were tired of it, <laughs> and you know wanted you know some new system to to develop, and they developed the system of nation states. Um, 
is similar to what we saw after the Second World War, where you know you get this Treaty of Westphalia that is kind of like uh, the the you know the Marshall Plan, and um, you know the, the after the Second World War, where you get um, the creation of NATO, the European Union, the United Nations, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, times of crisis bring about uh, tremendous change. Something you know we should think about today. So, in terms of what are the characteristics of the state, um, states have to balance how much liberty they give individuals and how much power the state has, and it's, it's a tricky balance. And we're seeing it, you know, right now that it's, you know, it's a it's a very hard balance. Um, how do we balance, you know, the need to protect people from uh, this pandemic with uh, the need to protect their individual uh, freedoms and rights, and so on? So, you know big challenges ahead. Oh, you remember when we talked about globalization, whoops, we talked about, uh, you know, people were thinking that nation states were, you know, not very important anymore. You know, the hyper globalizer are saying they don't really even matter anymore. Well, in the last few weeks, that's all been thrown in the trash. Um, you know, governments are enacting very, very strong restrictions uh, that are, you know, essentially shutting the market down. Um, so, you know, the idea that markets are more powerful than governments uh, just, you know, doesn't seem to hold true right now, um, or at least governments are able to impose uh, a tremendous will upon, upon markets. So we've been talking about democracy, and there's different types of democracy. Um, the first, generally, uh, the first type that we'll discuss is direct democracy. This is sort of the idealistic uh, type of democracy. This is the system in which, you know, everybody in the group uh, takes part, um, everyone participates, uh, you know, we all vote. So this would be, you know, if this were to happen in the United States or other countries, everybody would vote on everything, which means it's not very realistic. You know, it's not very realistic. Most of us don't know anything about uh, a whole range of, uh, of government policies and things governments uh, is working on. So we have what's called liberal democracy or representative democracy. This is based on the idea that um, we vote people into office, and oftentimes this comes with uh, the notion of the free market. Not necessarily always, um, but historically we've seen liberal representative liberal and representative democracy excuse me, accompanied by uh, free markets. So as, as we talked about, you know, this comes from <coughs> excuse me, the United States. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of modern democracy has its roots in uh, the Enlightenment and in the, in, in the American Constitution. Um, you know, the American Constitution is one of those documents that's, and the founders are, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's, where it's very contradictory. You have, on the one hand, the slave owners and uh, people who are denying all sorts of freedoms. Uh, on the other hand, they also develop a document that becomes, that sort of enshrines these freedoms that go on to inspire uh, freedom movements and liberation movements around the world. Um, America was born in contradiction, and you know, just being aware of those contradictions, I think, is is important. So, uh, the end of history again. Remember Francis Fukuyama when we talked about globalization. I uh, talked about you know liberal democracy as you know we would reach we'd be reaching the end of history. Everybody would want free market capitalism, uh, and and liberal democracy. Ah, you know, that's just not looking like it's going to be the case. Um, I think he still stands by his general theory that these are the best systems, but as we talked about, you know, he's started to recognize that uh, our political orders are falling apart, and I think um, this latest pandemic has really accelerated some of these processes. So what's falling apart? Uh, liberalism. Here. Liberalism in the broad sense, in the, in the broad sense of openness, free markets, democracy, free movements of people, uh, these sorts of things. These things were already kind of, you know, coming undone. These books were, were published over the last few years um, as more sort of authoritarian leaning governments have sort of taken over or won elections, I should say, uh, in, in, in Western democracies. You've seen this retreat from uh, ideas of openness and, and so on. Um, 
when we talk about democracy, it's a good, it's kind of important to know what we're talking about. Karl Popper wrote this great book called The Open Society and Its Enemies, basically attacking Plato, Marx, uh, and, and Hegel. And anyway, he kind of points out that, you know, one of the things about democracy that people don't understand is that what democracy really does is it provides us a, with a way in which to remove bad leaders without bloodshed, <laughs> which, you know, historically, most leaders have been, you know, had their heads chopped off or, or something like that. Uh, so this is a way where, you know, you just get a lot of people to say, get out of here. Um, and, you know, they then they leave. And, you know, uh, that's, quite, that's quite an innovation considering, you know, what we had done beforehand. Um, and he kind of points out the, the importance of the right to complain, how, you know, that's so important. Uh, even in uh, a government like China, which is much more authoritarian, uh, you know, allows its people to complain on, on, on Weibo and, and other uh, social media platforms because they're able to sort of monitor and see what, the, see what people are unhappy about. <coughs> and that ten, and, tends to be a very, uh, uh, gives government a more legitimacy because then they can go and address uh, those issues. So this chart though, so <clears throat> for people who are worried about democracy, whoa, whoa. Um, as I said, democracy is in trouble, but it is also, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> it is also um, on the rise. So this is a scale looking at democracy versus autocracy. Um, where the higher you go, the higher numbers mean more democratic government. And on the bottom, the uh, x-axis, you see the, the year, the timeline. And so basically you see that, th you know, the, especially since the 1980s, the world has been wanting more democracy. Throughout the 1800s, you're wanting more democracy. Uh, one thing, oops. One thing you see, you see in about 1920, this big dip happens. What happens there? Well, you have a couple of things happen. Um, you have uh, the rise of fascism. You have the the rise of Bolshevism, Soviet the Soviet Union. Um, you also have the pandemic of 1918, which brought in a more authoritarian mentality. Uh, and but primarily, you have the rise of authoritarian movements such as fascism and communism. Um, and you see dips in democracy at, during the Cold War as a result of that and other, you know, dictatorial regimes were being propped up uh, by the United States, if not by the communists. Um, and then you see a rise in terms of democratic uh, movements since the 1980s. Um, and today, you know, you see movements in Hong Kong, uh, in, in Sudan, and in, in places around the world that are, that are uh, advocating for uh, greater rights. What happened? I, I think we're likely to see in the 2020s this take a dip again uh, as, as governments respond to uh, the pandemic. So we're going to have a sort of interesting pandemic politics happen, which I'll probably get to uh, probably in, in the lecture. I'll go another 10, 15 minutes uh, and then probably finish up this lecture on Monday. So one thing that was already leading to um, more sort of authoritarian movements and kind of closing, restricting of borders already was this increase in refugees and migrants around the world. Um, part of this is just the world population has grown and with more people, you know, you have uh, people looking for work. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, some people are moving to places where you have a lot of elderly, where they need younger workers. But oftentimes immigration can, as we talked about, it can lead to a backlash and, and uh, you know, governments trying to enact restrictions, trying to, you know, protect their cultures and this sort of thing. And we see that, uh, you know, throughout history and we see it uh, happening right now. And we're going to, you know, what happens with migration and refugees as a result of the pandemic is unclear. Um, you know, it's not going to stop the movement of people, but it's definitely going to uh, slow it down quite considerably. So a lot of the, the recent refugee crisis happened because of, uh, of the war in Syria that displaced a huge, huge, huge amount of people. Now, again, we could see governments fall in the coming years, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Syria. You could see other places really, you know, really be challenged. 
um, and that could mean you know even even greater flows of refugees. We're also likely to see uh, climate refugees in the years ahead. Um, so you know that's what we're more likely to see than anything else. So uh, well, not anything else, but um, we're we're just as likely to see that as we are uh, people leaving from war and so on. Um, so you know refugee migration issues, even with the pandemic, these are things that are uh, going to be, you know, are going to remain. This is just another chart uh, going over some of this, uh, some of this information, looking, kind of breaking down the numbers a bit more, and you can look at that uh, in the PowerPoint in uh, the modules. Um, if you're interested in this subject and, you know, maybe want to go into in more detail, uh, Paul Collier, a, an economist at Oxford, has, has done some good work in this area. He's kind of looked at different ways in which governments can set up refugee policies and, you know, try to manage migration. Again, this is pre-pandemic, so, you know, just keep that in mind. Because we see, as I said, we see the rise of guys in their underwear, no, uh, of what we call strong, what are called strongmen leaders. Now, whether you think they're actually strong or not is, you know, uh, your opinion. Uh, but that's sort of this term we, we, we use to refer to these leaders who, while they may be elected, um, they're often elected and kind of turn the system into a go from going from a liberal representative democracy to an illiberal democracy uh, a governing system which you know you still have elections but you generally start to see civil liberties disappear you start to see attacks on the press um, you start to see governments doing things without transparency without reporting on what they're doing uh, and things like this so um, this is something that you know again, talking pre-pandemic politics, uh, you know, I think, you know, you're already seeing authoritarian sentiments on the rise. I was actually going to go to uh, Oxford University in June and give a talk on this, um, but that's not happening now. Um, but you have one out of six people in American Europe who think that it would be okay for the military to rule, so military government. Uh, it used to be one out of 16 just 20, 30 years ago. Um, and about 20% out of wealthy millennials are okay with military rule. So, you know, this could be that, you know, that new aristocracy we talked about when you talk about uh, stratification. Um, you know, if they wanted to, you know, in, entrench their power and stuff, uh, they could try and bend military power to, to their will as they get older and more politically powerful. The big change is that the greater supporters of democracy right now tend to be poorer people, and the wealthy are the least uh, greatest supporters, which is actually the reverse of what it was uh, back in the 1990s. So you see, whoops, so you see some of the, um, <laughs> some of the, uh, illiberal rulers, Jair Bolsonaro, um, Viktor Orban of, Tur of Hungary, Bolsonaro of, uh, of Brazil, uh, Duterte in the Philippines, uh, Maduro in Venezuela, all of them have been elected, but they're also clamping down on civil liberties, and they're doing a lot of things that we see uh, illiberal and autocratic rulers uh, doing, and I look like I'm one of them in this, in this picture. Um, and of course, we have we have oops, we have Putin and Trump. Trump fits in there as well. Um, more than previous presidents, you know, he attacks the press and uh, uh, you know, you know, talks about how talks about a lot of things he wishes he could do, and he you know, he can he tell he can tell he admires and sort of is somewhat jealous of uh, of the autocrats. Obama, you know, when he was interviewed in his first year of the presidency, he said something that, you know, it would be a lot easier to be a di dictator. So presidents always have sort of an illiberal uh, tendency uh, to them, but, you know, you see variations in, in how big that is. Um, you know, the, the big question is where China goes. You know, China is not a liberal democracy by any stretch of the imagination um, and does not appear to be going in that direction. A lot of people hyper-globalizers back 20, 30 years ago thought that as capitalism expanded, uh, so would democracy. That was the whole end of history in Fukuyama and so on. And, you know, they thought it would happen in China as well. And that's, that certainly has not been the case. If anything, we're starting to see that, you know, 
China's method of rule, um, you know, is changing politics. And, you know, we are seeing governments become more uh, authoritarian and, you know, arguably for good reason to protect the population. But that also raises big questions about individual rights, uh, individual liberties, uh, and so on. And it's unclear exactly uh, where some of this is going. Um, <clears throat> When, this is just looking at some of the some of the different measures that countries have taken and, and companies and so on um, to, to 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 confront uh, COVID nineteen and and the, uh, the the risk that they they place to civil <coughs> excuse me civil liberties. So you see quarantine enforcement, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, China uh, have all done that. Medium risks, um, basically looking at GPS data contact tracing where you're trying to know where people have been kind of depending on how people do it it can be high um, because you know knowing what you've done for the last week is you know a huge invasion of your privacy um, that sort of thing flow modeling knowing how many people go through different places looking at phone data that sort of thing we already do a lot of that so that's not perceived as a huge risk right now so social graph making we don't really know yet um, but it's seen as being kind of a high risk. You know, it's not really happening right now, but this is uh, basically kind of um, using machine learning and stuff and starting to understand when people meet each other and who people are meeting. And that could be a, a big, big risk. You can, you can just imagine governments, uh, you know, clamping down on, on civil liberties as a result of that. So it's a new world we, we are entering. Um, and I'm going to end it there. Um, I'll be uh, posting a couple of videos that I would have normally played, uh, primarily, you know, kind of talking about Weber and, and types of government uh, and so on. And I'll, I'll kind of finish this up on, on, on Monday um, and, I'll, and I'll move on to the next lecture uh, then as well. Uh, have a good weekend. I know it's a, you know, these are historic chaotic times. Um, I wish you the best. I wish you and your family uh, and your friends and everyone you know uh, good health. Um, stay sanitized, do some reading, whatever you need to do uh, to, to get through these times um, and we'll resume on Monday. On